who's here. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and pass it right over to uh, the USGS to start their presentation. Uh, so for those of you who don't know, PEP has some new employees. Uh, Sarah Cernadas Martin uh, is on this call. Jade Belenau is on this call. We're happy to have them here in the program office. Uh, joining us today on this call are Adam Stark, TNC, Alexa Fournier, DEC, Anthony Cananio from Summit County, Carla Boo, TNC, Casey Personius, uh, DEC, uh, Cassie Bauer, DEC, Kathy Haas, DEC, Chris Schubert, USGS, Dan Kendall, Don Walter, um, I think both USGS, Dan, apologies if uh, that's not true, Elizabeth Cole, uh, Long Island Regional Planning Council, uh, Emily uh, F. Stratton, Eric Starr, Greg Rivar, Cornell, Holly Stanford, the Land Trust, um, Jen Katz and Jen Paluski, I think both USGS, Jeremy Campbell, uh, Director at SSER, Jack Monte, USGS, Kali Yan, uh, USGS, Ken Ziegel, Summit County Health, Matt Sclafani, PEP TAC Chair, Michelle Golden, uh, DEC, Paul Masut, Pete Topping Baykeeper, uh, Rob Calarco, uh, I'm not sure in what capacity uh, Rob is joining us today, Ron Bouchelano, USGS, uh, Sally Kellogg, SSER, and also um, Valerie Vagona, who is the new PEP Outreach Coordinator. So welcome everybody. Uh, I, great apologies if I got your organization wrong, please put it in the chat so that we can get it right next time. And Ron, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you now. Uh, so, so uh, uh, Kala will speak, uh, so we're gonna share a, uh, we have a SharePoint common presentation that we've all worked on that's kind of resides in our SharePoint site. So I think Kala is going to go ahead and share that on his screen. I'm, my internet may be a little iffy up here with this stuff. So um, yeah, okay, everybody uh, can see that. You know, it, I was just thinking it's been a while since we sort of updated everybody. And I think the last time we presented some things, you folks was probably back in late summer, I would think. And we kind of laid out sort of a revised timeline as we talked about aligning this project with some other uh, work we're doing as part of the Long Island Sound Studies. We wanted to have a common set of tools and methods and everything else. And so we'll get into that a little bit. Um, we could just jump right into it. it could. Next slide, Paul. So, uh, you know, essentially you kind of break this up into three different thrusts in this project. Um, the first one is sort of a regional modeling. Um, trust and that's kind of what I've been really kind of uh, dealing with uh, on this project. And the next is uh, the the modeling specifics of the Peconic watershed and the Peconic inset modeling. And Kala has uh, taken the lead on that part of the project. And then Jen Katz has taken the lead on the scenario development uh, part of the project. So just a real quick update here. Uh, you know, we're developing a new regional model island-wide as part of the Long Island Sustainability Project. And you know, as part of that, some really big advantages um, that applies to the work we're doing uh, even out here in Peconic, even though you know, our big thrust right now is a lot of work in New York City and so forth, but it is a regional model that covers the entire island. As they're updating to a, a, new, uh, a newer version of Montflow, which is the barometer flow model we use for Montflow 6, and it's a new, the latest version of that, uh, it, it's the advantage there is it's a model that can simulate both a dynamic freshwater saltwater interface, uh, which is a density process coupled perfectly or coupled with uh, explicitly with simultaneous nitrogen transport. So we were gonna be struggling with a way of kind of almost a hacky way of trying to like bridge the gap between a time varying interface island wide and nitrogen transport, but now we don't have to uh, because it actually does it simultaneously. And the, this is a relatively new development and we've been speaking with the, uh, the USGS the developers of the software in the USGS and they're pretty excited about uh, this project because it's be the first major application of that new, uh, those new capabilities to a, a societal issue. So, you know, we have kind of, that's kind of great to get people um, interested, you know, in the, on the research side with what we're doing. Um, you know, we've, uh, 
another a part of the regional analysis, and we've shown a lot of this over the years, is the historical nitrogen loading. And Jack Monty has been working on that. He gets he gets he kind of keep, keeps getting pulled off, uh, helping out with the the regional modeling part with the company and everything. But uh, one thing he's tackling, and, and we don't have to go too much detail about this. He could talk about it maybe at the next meeting. Is just some he's got the source terms developed for Suffolk County for 1900 to 2019. And island wide, we're just possibly looking at some revisions or at least a range of values for the ag loading rates. So that's kind of a sort of like ongoing little little things that are going on as part of the nitrogen source park. Um, but we're going to talk mainly today about what we're doing specifically in the watershed as the Peconic Inset modeling. Uh, we have a transient um, version of the Peconic model. We actually have a sort of a steady flow and a, and a seasonal in season off season model. Um, We've done a number of analysis, including uh, delineating watersheds, particle tracking, clinical travel times. That's been done. And uh, Klaus now developed a, a site transport model at the inset scale that's coupled to the to the, uh, the regional model. And one of the big tasks for us today is on the scenarios. Uh, Jen has taken a deep dive into the Suffolk County's uh, subwatersheds plan. We understand that better. And um, Jack has completed the current 2019 sources for the Peconic area, and that's part of the scenario. That's our initial source that we then manipulate as part of our scenarios. And we've done a few preliminary scenarios um, that will show, and we're just sort of digging into some of the more advanced scenarios, and, and that's where we're running into questions that we wanted to uh, bring the group in on. And uh, also, uh, uh, Claude's been developing a, a sort of a dashboard. that We've been sort of brainstorming on how we might serve up all this information in the back end, so it's somewhat user friendly, and so he's exploring possible ways of doing that. Uh, we'll, but we'll get into all that detail in a moment. And just uh, if you move on to the next slide, Bala. Well, this kind of underscores the, the fact that we originally, you know, the green. This was some inset model we developed as part of island wide as part of the general uh, nitrogen effort. And of course, the good old conic models out there in the green. It's been now updated. Be consistent with these other two models. We have an east and west long arm sound model taken together. They cover the whole island. And of course, as part of the long arm sound study, the eastern third of that is in the Peconic models. That's why it's important to make sure that these all line up, uh, which is, uh, you know, kind of made us sort of adjust the timeline for Peconic, as we talked about last summer. So this is kind of the big picture on what we're up to. Um, if people are interested in the east and west, uh, we have inset models right now, they're just sort of steady state. To get things kind of working, um, but the Peconic is much farther along, obviously. And I think so, Clyde. We're going to get into the modeling here. It's probably best if you maybe kind of take take over from here. Um, Sounds good. The details. Yeah. Okay. I'll go ahead and mute. All right. So yeah. <clears throat> so taking a, a peek closer, more closely at the Peconic inset uh, that was in green uh, on the last slide. Um, here's a, just a quick uh, update on sort of just comparing the results of that model, uh, the flow model, to what we have uh, out of the regional model. Um, so on the left here is a bar graph uh, of the two flow budgets, basically accounting for all the water moving throughout the model. Um, uh, so Peconic is on the left, the inset model is on the left, and then the regional model is on the right for that Peconic area. Um, so you can see very good agreement between those budgets uh, and also a good agreement for the water tables that these steady state models generate. Um, so that's what's shown here on the right with the uh, Peconic inset water table with the solid lines and then the, the regional uh, water table uh, with, in the dashed lines. Um, Oh, and as I go along here, if anybody has any questions, um, you know, just uh, I don't know if I can see like a raised hand or something or just, you know, unmute and, and shout it out. And uh, I'm happy to happy to answer those as we go along. Um, so continuing on. Um, so this Peconic inset steady state version, um, we've also done a little particle tracking uh, to just map out the recharge area to, to uh, major receptor types. So that's what this figure shows here. Um, so these, um, these receptor areas um, are then 
sort of this is the, like the broadest version of these receptor areas uh, and then but a subset of these goes into the actual um, results from the transport model to sort of look at nitrogen loads to those so those will be a little bit farther along in the presentation um, we also have groundwater travel times to those receptors uh, and so this information is used in part uh, to, to help build this scenarios. So the uh, SWP takes into account uh, groundwater travel times for some of the phases. And so um, we'll be using this information uh, in building those um, so that you know we have the same groundwater times that are in our model going into uh, how we build the, the scenarios. Um, so this figure, uh, the lightest, <clears throat> the lightest colors are are the longest travel times. Darkest colors, the shortest, and you know you can see that generally shorter times closer to shore, um, as well as the sort of circles, um, these kind of circular blobs that denote water that is going into pumping wells. All right, cool. So then, thinking more now about the transport model, um, so it involves. 2019 uh, nitrogen concentrations uh, in recharge. So that's what's going, the nitrogen that's going into the model um, for these sort of next 100 years that we're modeling. Um, and as Don said, those are built uh, for, through, by Jack Monty. Um, and he's taking into account uh, five different potential sources, uh, septic, residential fertilizer, atmospheric deposition, uh, agricultural livestock, and agricultural crop fertilizer. Um, and so Jack calculates um, annual loads, potential annual loads that then I, I am taking and using um, recharge rates that we have uh, and doing some unit conversion to actually get concentrations that you see plotted here in, in milligrams per liter. So that's uh, milligrams per liter of the water that's recharging down into the aquifer. And those, the, this sort of next step scenario models um, also start out with initial groundwater nitrogen concentrations that are set from the results of that 1900 to the present regional model. Um, so the, the sort of final result of that model, we, we inset that and use that to set the, um, set the initial condi conditions of this inset model. So uh, just for an example, here we have on the left, uh, the concentrations, again, in milligrams per liter of the shallow upper glacier. In this case, it's layer one in our model. Uh, and then another example here for the, the shallow Magathy, uh, layer six uh, in our model. Um, all right. So with that then set up the transport model, um, we then start to uh, run some of these baseline scenarios. Um, so Don, I don't know if you want to jump in here, but I can sort of explain a little bit first um, that we've, um, we're going to talk about all the scenarios that were, that were outlined a while ago, um, but we've also kind of color coded them a little bit um, to kind of aid um, you in, understand, in understanding our understanding of the, of the scenarios. So we've color coded um, scenarios in green, ones that we feel good about, sort of have a good understanding of. Um, Perhaps we might need a, a sort of uh, additional data from from folks, but but for the most part, we have a good handle on them. We've um, highlighted some of them in orange, where we feel like we need a little bit um, extra data, <laughs> or uh, you know we have uh, some slightly more difficult questions to answer. Uh, and then we have some marked in red later on in the presentation. You'll see where we think that might uh, not really be possible within the scope of the project right now. Um, Don, does that sound like a a good um, <laughs> A set, yeah, uh, sort of summary. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we, we can go, and and guys, so we're I think we're going to get into the the audience participation part of the of the, the process here as as we go through this. Um, you know, so as Klaus said, green means it's a scenario that you know either we have done, easily can do, or we just have a couple obvious questions that are like simple one words or like you know give us a number and we're good. And you know, so one of those, and you know, we've kind of renumbered these a little bit. Um, because the numbering was, was a little confusing to us. So we'll call them the zero scenarios, baseline scenarios. You know, so the first one, you know, pre-development nitrogen load. Well, 
you know, I'm, we're assuming, I guess, you start with a, you know, concentration in the aquifer that is representative of background conditions, you know, bone fracture or whatever it is, um, or less. Uh, and then uh, are, are we thinking, and again, this is why you're recording it and taking notes. Hopefully, you know, you, you can maybe have another, you know, shorter term or maybe another follow up in like a week or two, you know, where, where we could actually talk more about this once you got a chance to, to digest it. But so this first one is that we were thinking, you know, initial concentration, white background, and then applying essentially atmospheric from say around 1900, which might be kind of background, uh, not perfectly, but, you know, something like that, or maybe extrapolating back and even lowering it more. And then maybe some kind of nitrogen cycling, maybe in forested areas or some kind of addition to low, I don't know, low. We have to think about that, but we're not, so we're getting kind of out of our area of expertise and we start thinking about you know, some of these inputs. So that's something to think about. But the background concentration is to start in the aquifer, 1900 or, or, you know, atmospheric, and then some baseline forested uh, nitrogen load, uh, and then run that out. Is that, is that kind of what stakeholders and, and folks are, are, are envisioning for that? Or you want to think about that for a few days? Okay, well, yeah, this, anyway, that's, that's worth it. That's, but that's the sort of thing we need that. So uh, the next one, you know, 0 0.2, we'll call it no further nitrogen loading. This means essentially, um, you know, we would just shut off terrestrial nitrogen. You know, it's, it's obviously an unrealistic scenario, it's possible, but we want to see basically in an extreme case, how quickly things flush out to different receptors. It is a baseline analysis. And so, you know, that would be, we probably just would have, we would just probably have to apply current atmospheric loading al alone as our, as our input and nothing else. Um, then there's a 0 0.3, which is sort of the no action alternative. That's an easy one. We just essentially take 2019 sources and run them out. And, you know, you're going to see kind of a change because you still have the legacy effects in there. And you will see, we'll be interested to see how that, you might actually see loads come down. No action a bit. So, that's an easy one to do. Um, and then reduce atmospheric nitrogen deposition. You know, uh, what's the reduction uh, the, the people might like? You know, is it 10% possible, more? You know, we, we just need some guidance, I think, on all this. Um, and then we come, we come to our first orange, uh, zero 05 here, and it's a, a potential future uh, full build out at the current allowable density. Uh, Jack um, has some spreadsheets that have parcel IDs and everything. And we just don't know uh, how to turn that into spatial data that we need to then map to our model grade to come up with nitrogen numbers. So that's, you know, there's some, you know, that's some, uh, we don't know how to sort of skin that cat. You know? so, it's, so, you know, we need, we need J, JS data sets and some understanding from the towns themselves on what their build out is. Ideally, what we would get, Sure. I was just, this is Joyce. Um, I, I just want to ask, so for five, um, I, I'm wondering how best we can help answer this, right? So are you looking for us to get to the towns? Are you looking for a percentage of future build out? You know, like an additional 10%, um, an additional 50%, whatever that is. Will it vary? because of spatial differences from town to town? Yeah, I think it, I'm not sure how to skin this cat. Yeah, I, I, well, I, we were, maybe it would be, uh, you know, we have our current sources and maybe it would be an idea of how uh, vector data on um, all potentially develop, developable properties in each town, and ones that are currently developed and then ones that aren't but could be developed that we would then bring in and we would add those nitrogen loads to the model. So there's some kind of some kind of way with the GIS to have to parse out like here's current nitrogen load. Obviously, ag is not really part of this. Um, it's really on the residential, so it's the lawn fertilizer and the septic. Of okay, here's our current, and then what is our what if if it's full build out, whatever that means for each town. What, what areas are going to be added as residential load that currently is not? 
would be okay. Would be essential. Yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't know. Um, yeah, we kind of look to maybe have you folks help coordinate that with coordinate that with the towns. And you know, um, you know, uh, Jen Katz, who's you know, kind of lead on these scenarios, is physically um, on Long Island. So perhaps I don't want to volunteer here, but perhaps you know she could even go out if there if COVID protocols allow. She can meet with towns and maybe start to get this stuff together. Uh, so, or, or so can I? Can I just say this out loud? And anybody who's on this call, um, if if they want to weigh in or not, but starting down the path of um, available undeveloped parcels that are zoned for residential development, and then looking at those on a GIS. I, you know, I feel like that's fairly easy from a GIS perspective to get at. And then are we looking at if 50% of these are developed, if 100% of these are developed, of the undeveloped parcels currently zoned yeah. for development, correct? Yes. So are there, so that the build out, okay, is it um, future full? So I guess full means 100% and the future would be Whatever, yeah, you're right. You could you could do, but how do you how do you what do you randomize that? How do you do that? You know, it's within the town. You, um, how do you know which which fifty percent will be developed or not? That that gets a little tricky. So that you know, there again, but we but we would look to the towns, um, maybe feeding in through you folks on coming up with, okay, Southampton, this is going to be our you know quote. Uh, additional load from build out that we came up with based on like you just described Joyce uh, empty lot empty land that could be developed in a residential and then you know we went ahead and we said what if we only have that we chose the parcels I, it's a tough one it's a, it is a tough one um, but it's the kind of you know it's so but what we just laid out might be the way to go maybe we start with a full build out and just a bracket you know the worst case so maybe it's the simple which is also the easiest and simplest simplest to implement because it is just what you described, right? Those parcels, and we then add, you know, based on our various assumptions and everything, we add the load in there, as if it went from undeveloped to developed residential. So that would be the full build out with what we just described. You know, we could probably move this if we we're getting that if we got that data. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, yep, that yeah. So that's one of the one of the oranges that we were looking. Hey Joyce, um, I and can. hey, um, do you folks, uh, Don? Do you folks have the? Did, you mentioned spreadsheets. Do you know if those were the spreadsheets that were developed for the um, subwatersheds wastewater plan? Like we had, uh, we had done a build out. Our planning department had done a um, pretty detailed build out analysis, parcel by parcel. Um, for the entire county, all the towns as part of the SWP. And it, at the time, you know, it was from 2016 data, but it took into account a lot of different things um, that probably just need to be thought of a little bit. You know, it's not just town zoning, it's also that Article 6 sanitary code uh, comes into play if that's more stringent than town zoning is. And um, it's not just residential parcels, there are other parcels, agricultural parcels that may not have covenants or have been sterilized and can be converted to residential and all that stuff was, we, I guess we may have some information that may be of uh, use to you if you're, um, if you don't have it already. Yeah, that sounds, yeah. that sounds great, Ken, because I think that I don't think we have, if those were, you know, published as like shape files or something that I don't think we have those. So that would be, yeah, that would probably be a, a nice, maybe the simplest way of, of putting this, this particular scenario together. Okay, let's, let's circle back together. I know, I know the data that we got from planning uh, were in Excel spreadsheets, but um, on the same token, our, our consultant had to also convert that into something, into a model domain, right? And so right. they, would have, they would have had to do something to either convert them into shape files or have some sort of file that bridge the gap, so to speak. So let's uh, let's definitely circle back together. Yeah, yeah Ken, Kyle, I will send out um, uh, an email and Ken, you can feel free to include whoever you want on that. 
um, trying to get at this. And I think if once we can get Suffolk County's data, then maybe we can see if that's enough or if we should also reach out to town planning departments. Um, yep. Right, or if what you've done already covers it. Yeah, this all, this all sounds really good. Um, you know, whatever works, already been, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. And we want to try to be as consistent as we can with what's been going on countywide, obviously. So this is good. Cool. Um, yeah. Can we go to the next, next set of yeah. scenarios then? Yeah, so that's good. Okay, good. Good on that. Okay, so the next, so we're getting into kind of um, the next tranche of scenarios, like in, in our mind, if we prioritize in our mind, this would be like the next thing we want to work on. And it is um, connected to the uh, subwater sites plan. And, you know, it, the two, we just sort of added this one here, and that's a sort of a, a sort of instantaneous implementation of um, the, the plan, which I know it's a phase plan, but I think that's something that we yeah. can start with. And then, then we had, as laid out, in the plan, which you know is the details are here, uh, and then fifty percent faster and slower. So, you know, and Kali, Jenny, I think we have a pretty decent understanding of the plan. Yeah, you know? I think so. Yeah, I think the the two kind of the two main, in addition to the sort of questions and clarifications that I that we have, or you know that we have under questions and clarifications down there, um, I do want to kind of ask to make sure that. Um, our reading of this scenario one, um, which is distinct from 2.1, it, it, it is, the, is that it basically occurs immediately. Um, and that was sort of, that was our reading of the, of that sort of final draft of these, that outlined these scenarios. And so I think I want to just make sure um, as a group that that's, <laughs> that's the correct way of, of interpreting that scenario one. Um, so if if, uh, if 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 that you know I guess if nobody says that it isn't then I think we'll go we'll run with that. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Cool. Well, I guess that's I guess we're good there. Okay. Yeah. Well, then, um, so then, can I maybe we can when we jump on a call the county can just confirm. Confirm. Yeah. yeah, yeah totally. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's totally fine. And, and I think a lot of, uh, and as we go through this, I, um, I just want to highlight that um, a lot of this building um, can be done, you know, it, it isn't a, if, if, if there is a, a shift in sort of how we're interpreting these scenarios, um, it takes some time to change, but it's not like impossible. Uh, so yeah, that's totally fine. Yeah, we, we, we recognize that there's a lot to digest here. So folks might want to they may not have much to say now as they think about it, but maybe with it, be, with it being recorded, they can go back and and you know put some more thought into it, and then we could have you know we could have a, we could have as many scenario follow up calls as we need. We don't have to wait for you know every three months. We don't well we don't want to wait for every three months. I don't think. Um, so you know what's so I, I'm envisioning probably a smaller group of folks getting together and you know digging into this more as we need as people get the kind of things that will out there um but you know so gloss so you so the thing we need i guess for these that we don't have yeah i want to go through those the questions the yeah presentation that you had. totally yeah. yeah so the way that the way that um i have developed the scenarios right now is to basically take those two phases and have a, a linear reduction in the amount of nitrogen that's being loaded to these specific priority areas as outlined in the phases um, a linear reduction from the initial load that, that like 2019, um, you know, 2019 concentrations that I showed earlier down to the goal, um, reduction, uh, load. So in each phase, it basically, you know, it's, it over, you know, phase one over 30 years goes from that initial down to the goal. And then for phase three, it goes from the initial down to the goal over 15 years. Um, does that sound uh like a, a good approach um so i think we want to make sure that um you know that's it's it's kind of hard to know exactly how <laughs> the uh what that reduction should look like um you know i mean i don't think the swp um and correct me if i'm wrong but uh 
I don't think it outlines like, okay, we're going to focus on, you know, this group of priority areas in the first five years and then move on to these other ones. I, I don't think that level of detail is in there. Um, if it is, then we would want to make use of it. But for right now, for these preliminary runs, I've been using just this sort of linear reduction. This is Ken, and just a just a quick heads up. The um, and we can talk more about it after. But um, the subtle difference that I see, I think generally your statements are correct. Everything you said. The only thing I'll say is phase two actually does have two separate sub phases that okay. are that are distinct geographic areas. So ah. we can we can talk more about that. But there is definitely cool. you'll want to take that into account, and it's easy. It's not it's not a big um, awesome. Not a heavy lift. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Can I just ask uh, a quick question? This is um, more or less looking at the temporal, right, effect? Right. So, you know, yes. so spatial may not be, I mean, obviously it'd be important to the loading. And if, like Ken said, there's these, uh, you know, sub areas that will affect it too. But, um, you know, overall, you're looking at a temporal question. So I think you're going to have to run it the way you proposed it to get it. You know, the linear is a, a, a first order assumption, but right what else do we have yeah the only other option is a, a more of a step function which is just not realistic so right yeah. and that's kind of what yeah. that's really what scenario one is right it's that instantaneous yeah. step change um right it, okay. you know, we could start to go into like you know a logarithmic or you know that kind of thing and that will just change the curves um in the time series basically yeah. um yeah, I mean, I don't know how much more value that's going to add. Um, right, yeah, right. I, if we don't have any other way to do it, you know, I'm not sure. You know, I mean, unless somebody has data that or other models that you've seen that would help. No, I, I, yeah. I think, I think, I think linear is fine. You know, I, the only thing here is like Ken just mentioned, maybe breaking this up into yeah, uh, phase two yeah. A and two B, but linear, linear applied to both. Yeah, and then yeah. phase three. So. Yeah, good. Okay. And just and, and linear, honestly, is kind of ha how the SWP assumes it's going to go anyway. So you'll oh, be cool. you'll be consistent with that as well. So that's even Wonderful. better. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I think this is an easy an easy question, but we're just assuming that fifty percent faster and slower is just like a halving or doubling of the years within the phases. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and then, and then Ken, maybe we can talk about this some other time too, but um, currently these uh, initial scenarios as we've developed them do not include phase four. Um, and so it, it, it seemed a little bit more loosely defined um, in the plan. And so I, I, I wasn't <laughs> sure exactly how to concretely code it in uh, to the development. And so um, that'll be something I think we want to I will, you know, if we want to include it, I just want to make sure that we um, do it correctly. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, um, sounds good. Yeah. We didn't, we, because it was beyond 50 years down the road and kind of, we kind of limited our planning horizon to 50 years. We didn't include a detailed right. plan. So yeah, that's, if, if we, if phase four is to be included in this, then that's definitely going to warrant some additional discussion um, just to come up with the best assumptions for that. Right, because so that, just to ask you, well, well, I have you here because uh, phase. It seems like phase four has. Um, it's. It, if I'm trying to. I'm going to paraphrase incorrectly here, probably, but it was sort of. It said something about remaining areas that were not included in phase two and phase three. Um, are those are those remaining areas sort of in these? Um, you know, like the surface water area priority priority areas and that kind of thing. Are those or are those outside would it be kind of like everything outside of those ranked areas yeah yeah just looking at okay. that graph just looking at the graph that you have up there it's basically any of those like white areas in the middle okay yep. okay okay yeah so we could probably figure something out um where yeah all right well, we'll, we'll so we, yeah we, if we want to include it we'll just have to kind of yeah figure out what but like is it you know a, another 50 years is phase four or whatever yeah we'll just we can talk about that another time sounds good cool 
Um, and then I think we really have everything we need to build these. The only thing, the only shape files that we're missing are the groundwater management areas. Um, and I think that might just be uh, like, I, I don't think that that'll be hard to get, but we just have to, um, we just have to get those. Uh, that's no problem. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Sweet. Don or, or Jen, do you guys yeah. have any other thoughts about this? No, no, I think, I think we covered all the things that we were, we were talking about amongst ourselves. So perfect. And um, really, obviously, glad Ken's on the call here because this is, you know, that's the source. So this is all good. So, and then you have, what is your next? So it's, it's now moving on, I guess, to the travel time more. Yeah. Same yeah. So idea, then these, these yeah. scenarios to, to our understanding is basically just slightly um, a slight shift on the scenarios we were just discussing. Uh, and um, I think the, so basically just looking at slightly smaller areas. Um, and the questions I have just is basically, are we gonna use the same load reduction goals and phase timelines as we did in those scenarios to 0.1 to 2.3? Um, and, yeah. uh, and if we are, that's great. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at my questions here and I think, uh, I think I probably know the answer to 3.1 now, now that I'm reading it. 3.1 includes, I think, only phase two. Is that correct? Whereas 3. Point, oh, sorry. No, no, no. I don't. I do need to ask this. Sorry. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. 3.1 includes that, both phase two and three. Is that correct? I think that's correct. Okay, cool. Um, All right. So 3.1 is for rank. Rank one is two-year groundwater commitments. So essentially three one is phase two. Right? Yes. I mean, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes, okay. yes, 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 yes. You are correct. Absolutely. Okay. So, and that, so that is may, actually yeah. So that so that seems that might be a little redundant. We might just be doing this already. Yeah. The only the only subtle the only subtle difference though is phase two. Yeah. It will, it is actually, it's a smaller area. So this is the, it's like the, it's kind of the, like, this is, this is constrained to two to two oh, no, I get groundwater right. contributing areas yeah. it is, it is in different. the priority oh, areas my. rather than correct both priority areas and the groundwater. Yes. So it's a smaller, it's essentially. It, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, right. There's a subtle difference. You're right. I see it. Okay. Good. Cool. So I, I have a um, question. If you'll excuse me, I, I jumped on a little late, but I'm, what I'm listening to, this is Dorian Dale from the county, um, is um, I guess uh, the reliance on uh, the assumptions that are in the sub watershed plan and what is, what, how is that getting baked into the cellular transport model? I mean, to what degree are you um, uh, accepting that these objectives are gonna in fact be realized over the course of the next 50 years in the sequence that they're suggested? So well, uh, for, oh, sorry, go ahead, Don. Well, no, I, I would say that the short answer is, you know, we're using, uh, these are, so the assumptions in the, in the sub kind of the modeling done as part of that are kind of baked into these, these uh, watershed areas, right? And so that's what we're using as part of our, as part of the scenarios. So other than that, it's, it is a different, it's not necessarily linked to this, it's not linked to the same model, it's linked to a different model of the same area. I don't know if you're, talking about the modeling side of it or how the results of that, that work is being incorporated into this work. If that's the question, then it's essentially we're using those watersheds in the Suffolk County wastewater, uh, the Suffolk County subwatershed plan as our inputs into the scenarios. But yeah, we are assuming, we are basically assuming that what is outlined in the SWP is achieved. <laughs> um, okay. That's what that's what these scenarios yeah. are, are, are assuming. So in other words, in other words, like, in, other words uh, in other words, you're you're accepting the, the premise that is a projection at this point in time that there are going to be seven thousand systems a year being installed. Right. In, Basically, in that all the reduction goals are are reached is the uh, is the assumption that we're 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 making. Um, so we're yeah. So I'm just trying to think. So we're applying. You know, we have a nitrogen source term that 
we developed for this model, we're applying these watersheds to that source term. So, um, you know, I think we're just going to, yeah, we're going to assume we're going to implement it as is, and then we're going to see how long it takes to uh, to essentially reach reach that goal for, for actual things to clean up in a time series sense. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's related, it's slightly, slightly different, but it's, it's, it's you know, it's, it's related for sure. Right, but then implementation wise, the way um, that you that you folks are actually implementing it, um, kind of irrespective of the the side transport side and flushing and how, how long it actually takes to you know reach the service waters, in terms of um, number of upgrades and where they're going to occur during the different phases, that's definitely consistent with the SWP. You guys are pretty much. That, th those are your previous scenarios that we were just talking about. Those are pretty much um, yeah. the same, the same exact um, as laid out in the SWP. Other than you had a couple of sub scenarios that you were just dialing, um, dialing things a little faster or um, dialing things a little slower just to see what happens. But I think the short answer, Dorian, is yeah. These they're the primary scenario is um, the baseline scenario is as is in the SWP. Yeah, that's the yeah. So that's the reduction fraction there in the bottom map, right? That'll be that's from the the the, S, the SWP, right? That's so that's yeah. That's exactly what we're applying to the uh, to those areas in the inset model. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the, that response. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, cool. I think really, so then just for 3.3, and this is again, maybe, you know, maybe something that we just chat with you about Ken another time, but I just wanted to confirm that 3.3 is really looking at all groundwater contributing areas, basically less than 50 years um, in the, in that sort of final draft word document. Um, there was a, it, it, it was written out as this like two to 25 to 50 year range. And, and I just wanted to sort of um, clarify the syntax of that, that basically we're just like looking at everything less than 50 years. Yeah, so just uh, probably for you folks in the East End, the reason that that nomenclature was there, the 25 slash 50, was that the SWP, uh, in terms of inland boundary for phase three, like how far inland we were going, on the, on the east end, on the forks, we were going to the 25 year contributing area. Okay. Just cause relatively compared to the Western Suffolk, especially along the South shore. Right. They had, uh, relatively shorter travel times, just generally. Right. And so Western Suffolk, we, for our inland boundary for phase three, we go to the, and I have that line in the sand if you ever need to see it, but we're okay. changed from 25 to 50, but Western Suffolk, we're using the 50 year groundwater travel time as for I phase see. three. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so I'll probably try it. Maybe I can get that line from you just to make sure that we're doing this correctly. Yep. Um, sweet. Okay. Awesome. Um, and then again, yeah, just the groundwater management areas is what we just need to make sure that we incorporate those as well. Uh, so I think, uh, does anybody else have any questions? Um, okay. Yeah. Then I think, Don, do you want to move on to this section? Yeah, yeah, this is sort of, sort of back into our, our color coded. And they, we'll, you know, these are the scenarios we'll, we'll tackle in the out time here once we get to these, this, what we just talked about. Um, so, land management upzoning is kind of similar to the build out question. I mean, what does that mean exactly? How do we, you know, that pretty simple concept and statement, how do we turn that into actual shape file vector data that we can then map to the model for our source term? To come up with actual model inputs, so it's kind of a, kind of a similar thing as as um, zero point five, in the sense in the sense that it's you know a kind of a broad scenario that we don't have a great handle on on how to look to the PP and stakeholders and towns to kind of help get us something that we can use. 
it could probably be town specific, right? So, um, you know, that's a pretty broad scenario. We have certainly have, it sounds like Koala will have all he'll need to do the scenarios pretty much up to what we just talked about. So this is something uh, folks can think about and it, it takes some time to, to, to pull together. If it's something that um, um, so that, that, you know, that's that general thoughts on, on that. Um, Don, this is, yeah. this is Joyce. I, I think one of the original thoughts on this particular item, and I don't know if Matt is still on this call. I think he is, um, was yeah. that we use the critical lands protection strategy and the tier one um, places um, for both developed and undeveloped parcels um, if those were preserved, right? So some of them are okay. developed, right? So so if we could look at sort of 100% um, land preservation protection of the ones that came out as the top ranking in that. Okay, so that's not that complicated. No, that shouldn't be that complicated, but no. I mean, I, I don't know. We, we might want the towns to weigh in, potentially the land trust to look at what they have also prioritized and if that's the same, different, more or less areas. Okay, well, you know, we'll just follow this under, you know, um, getting a little more feedback from the towns on this. And again, you know, we, we can actually meet in person now and we're going to have and Jen can probably come out and, and work with towns yeah. directly. I, so. I, I tend to agree with Joyce that, you know, working with the towns would be a good idea on this. Um, they might be able to help, you know, get you a, a path forward that makes sense quantitatively um, as well. Um, one other thing I just wanted to throw out there that is, um, you know, it's just kind of an extension of the first issue that you were talking about with the build out. And I was wondering if we would, kind of flip it a little bit too and say building you know if we're building on like a, a full residential build out scenario which was the item number one uh, i was just wondering do you think it would, would be of interest to maybe you know consider the scenario of, of loadings um should all the existing like unprotected farms were to be converted to residential build out too i mean it's like you know it's, it's probably not likely and i think you know it might be a useful scenario to run as a total full build out of the East End. I mean, probably people 75 years ago living a little further west couldn't have imagined all the farms having been sold yeah. off and developed. So, you know, I don't know if we have that in the scenarios already, but to me, it was like another logical extension and kind of a test, you know, on such a case scenario happening because there's plenty of farms that maybe don't have any protection yet and they could become right. important targets for land protection, which Joyce just mentioned in the future. I, I don't, you know, I mean, you'd have to pick a parcel size of a half acre or whatever, um, but it would seem like something you might be able to run pretty straightforward. Well, you, know? you need to, uh, frankly, I think, uh, uh, plug into how the land preservation uh, program is going. Uh, there are uh, innumerable uh, tens of thousands of acres um, coming into the farmland program. It's, there's a lot of uh, very aggressive um, uh, efforts on particularly the part of the North Fork um, mm -hmm. to ensure that uh, farmland does not uh, become developable. Um, right. So uh, I think that needs to be contextualized uh, sure. by a, 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 a more thorough understanding of what's been happening, what is likely to happen um, so mm -hmm. that you're not uh, including um, more parcels than really are going to come onto the market. Yeah, no, that's good. I agree, Dorian. I, you know, I'm just trying to think conceptually of, you know, what happened in my lifetime out west in um, Suffolk. And uh, well, that's exactly why it, it's unlikely to <laughs> be repeated <laughs> for exactly that reason. Well, yeah, but I think it's good. Put it in a contextual format like that it might be a useful exercise just in case and help target more other, you know, areas that aren't on the list even. Um, so. so yeah, and, and I'll just add to that that critical land protection strategy parses out current agricultural lands. So we might be able to at least identify, again, with the county and the land trust, probably where there are easements mm -hmm. um, in that GIS layer um, right. to avoid having them inadvertently added to or subtracted yeah. from a future scenario. 
Great. So, yeah. So, so yeah, this is this is essential. This is kind of very closely related to build out. So, we think of build out as a worst case sort of thing. Something mm -hmm. like this is okay. Pulling back full build out. If we take measures to avoid full build out, mm -hmm. um, you would have something like this. And so, this would maybe be um, if you okay. Now that you yeah, I see it. Okay. Well, this is something that's you know we probably will move to green. I think we can do this. Um, you know, as long as we get can get the um, you know the some of the materials we would need to put into the model. Yeah, um, and. And that's great. Dorian made a very good point, and I totally agree. You know, I'm, I'm naive to a lot of these programs, but I think their department really knows. So, you know, if you're working with Ken and yeah. Dorian on this already, you know, you've got a great jump on it. So, and the yeah, other, yeah. The only other two cents. Uh, <laughs> I was just going to say, the only other two cents I'll add, and you guys can you know, consider this for your project or not consider this for your project, but um, the SWP build that analysis um, identifies watersheds, individual watersheds that are at high risk, meaning under the build out analysis, we set a threshold, whether, you know, if it was an increase of uh, total nitrogen load of 5% or 10% more than baseline conditions, whatever it was, we identified those watersheds, a lot of watersheds, the due to existing land preservation or protection just there was no mechanism so mm -hmm. um that may be another piece of useful data uh when you come up come up those scenarios as well that scenario yeah okay yeah that's good we, yeah that's good um yeah okay so so that's that's helpful and again you know this is uh you know we knew this would be a lot of you know homework for folks to kind of think about and so sort of you know why we're pulling everyone in now um but the next one is pretty basic right um sewer expansion you know this is a pretty easy easy to uh, implement these kind of scenarios we just need shape files timelines and what areas are going to be stored when you know to sort of explicitly represent and that'd be probably more of a step function type thing but um you know we would uh need that so that's pretty basic same with proposed sewers um you know they're uh, we would also want to know, you know, I, I assume these are on land disposal, you know, out ocean outfalls here. I, I, mean, I assume not. So we would just need those locations. And, and you know, not, this involves changing the actual flow model, but that's fine. Because you are know, move, moving any more hydraulic components to some of the scenarios, but that's okay. So we would do that. Um, so in 7 1, uh, you know, this is kind of getting into the lawn fertilizer. Uh, here is, you know, so we would just need to know, and we could probably do some reading on our own to come up with this, but line app turf fertilizer recommendations, we could research this, but I don't know if you folks had just a, a quick primer on what, what's in line map and turf fertilizer recommendations. We don't, we don't know, we, but we could probably on our own figure that out, just point us in the right direction. Um, and then obviously complete elimination of fertilizer. That's an easy one. Yeah. Don. All right, it's Michelle Golden, DEC. Um, when these scenarios were first being developed, um, we actually had a few um, separate meetings with kind of like a subgroup to determine those line app turf fertilizer recommendations and how they would be modeled. Um, I know folks from this group were, you know, part of it. Um, Sarah Schaefer ran it. I know she's no longer with us, but um, I can pull up those notes and, and send those along and and Joyce or um, Matt, I believe you were on those calls as well. Um, if you folks have similar notes, maybe we could just confirm that we're on the same page and then and then get that to USGS. That's a great idea, Michelle. I'll go through the file. Uh, Sarah Shaver kept really good notes and records, so I'm sure they're in there somewhere. Um, and we can send those along to USGS or we can talk first, Michelle, make sure we have the same notes and um, make sure that they get over to USGS. Wonderful, thank you. So, yeah, thank you, that's great. Um, so that's exactly, yeah, the kind of what we're looking for. So that's cool. Um, so 7.2, seven, seven that's an easy one, obviously. 7.3, um, so here, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the actual geochemical processes that go on with this, you know, you know, I don't, we're not, Completely familiar with, but we would have to convert 
the concept of a slow release fertilizer in some kind of a what's the effective decrease in ag load by percentage? Like, you know, is it it's not 50 percent, obviously, but it's you know, we just would have to come up, um, get a consensus because I probably nobody has the answer, but maybe getting with some of the ag folks on the technical side just to come up with a or anyone that understands this better than we do, come up with an idea of what, how, how would you effectively alter a, 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 uh, a current lawn fertilizer load in a certain parcel, how would you then um, alter that if it was slow release? We just don't have a great handle on that, but that's, yeah. no, that's a number we could probably, yeah, absolutely. Sorry, it's Michelle again. So that was also yeah, no. part of those conversations. And so, you know, I believe if my memory serves me correctly, we determined that we would just um, just do a change in the leaching rate of the model. Um, yep. But again, I will look at the notes. I'll confer with Joyce and, and we'll get back to you. But I know we talked about both 7.1 and 7.3 um, as like a little smaller subgroup, but with the ag, the ag folks were also part of that as well. Um, so we'll definitely get back to you on that. Yeah. So, Michelle, so Michelle, the question uh, I'd have as a follow-up is, um, to what degree does this dovetail with um, uh, the um, uh, work that Sue Van Patten was doing down here on the island um, uh, that did, I think addressed uh, all of these issues? Yep, so that is, so So 7.1, the lineup turf fertilizer recommendations, that's the work that Sue and I did through lineup where we had the, the work group, we met multiple times to, to come up with these recommendations. And then the PEP, PEP here um, decided that they wanted that as a scenario as well um, here to see what that would actually look like in the PEP area. And so uh, we ended up having just some conversations of how to actually model that like within the model. And so 7.3 slow release fertilizer uh, at 50% slow release, that is one of our recommendations. So it has to be accounted for within 7.1. So I don't know if 7.1 and 7.3 are, are separate scenarios or if they're really just one scenario. I mean, 7.1, like we have 50% slow release as a recommendation. Then we also have a reduction in the, um, the uh, application rate, whereas 7.3 is just the 50% reduction, I'm sorry, 50% slow release. So they are different. Um, but that's kind of, I guess, up to the entire group. I think these are already decided on. So um, 7.1 and 7.3 are two separate scenarios, but. Um, well, that, that's really great. So it sounds like we'll, we'll be turning these to green without too much trouble. Uh, again, we just need just need a fair amount of you know, more information on it, but it sounds like it's, you guys have thought a lot about this. So that's great. Um, yeah, thank you, Michelle. That's 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 good to know. Okay. Um, yeah, so so that's so there's I guess I guess we just have one more group of scenarios as we kind of move down the the list of possibles here and and one thing we might want to do is if people have a chance to think about this, you know, you can look at these slides. If you folks wanted to come up with a prior priority list, you know, of like, as we start working through these, we want to make sure we do the ones that are of most interest first. So that, you know, say is, you know, as close to the priorities as possible. So you, know, you might want to think about letting us know this list of, but I think if you add them all up, there's probably 20 scenarios um what the uh in your mind what the priorities might be uh as we go through this but but just finishing out uh the end of the list here you know this one increased nitrogen loads 10 20 to 30 percent representing ag land switch to livestock production um so we just didn't know is that will this be for specific parcels or is there, are they going to have is this something that really is going to happen um or is, you know, so we just, this one, we we're, we're, we didn't really have a lot of insight into what folks were thinking for this one. So any insights you could have, this would be great. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. think we can include this in the conversation we have with the ag folks. There was a concern when we started down this path or pre-COVID at some point that there was at least one farm who was, um, moving in this direction and that it was something that might increase. I don't know if that's still the case. So I will defer to the people yeah. who need us for. I'm sorry, Joyce, I think. Go ahead, Matt. I think this was Deborah 
uh, Aller, who, who had um, brought this up. And we might just want to reach out to her or to Nora and see what their thoughts are on it. I'm pretty sure that that came up in a meeting in Southampton College, um, at the uh, Southampton campus. So um, maybe we just reach out to her and get those answers. And then maybe the zoning departments or the, you know, or the, uh, the towns have a better insight into where these may happen. I mean, it seems like as we drill down into these things, it, it, gets, it gets tougher to, you know, do you do it? It's easier to probably model across the board um, than to do some randomization scheme or something that not, you know, I'm not sure which is more realistic. Um, so, but the, the towns maybe have specific parcels, maybe uh, Nora has some answers that, or Debbie that could help us predict what this is going to happen more. I, yeah, you know. Nora just put her contact details oh. in the chat. Oh, okay. So right. Yeah, all right. She's <laughs> adding her she's, okay. I think yeah. she's, she should have this conversation with us. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm on here. I'm feeling a little under the weather, but um, uh, yeah, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, you know, Debbie's still in the Cornell system, but she's she's left uh, CCE Suffolk and she's with Cornell University now. But um, yeah, we, we could talk about talk about this. I mean, we're seeing a, a small uptick in the interest in livestock, but by and large, we, we certainly have uh, far, far less here in Suffolk County than, than anywhere else in the state. Um, but anyway, happy to discuss my contact information is there. Great. Can you just clarify, Nora, what is CRF? Oh, sorry, uh, control release fertilizer. I'm sorry for the, okay. the acronym. Yeah, because I like the idea of putting in a potential or known established BMPs um, if that were possible. Yeah, and I don't know if it is, but um, if it is, that would be great. And if there's any information that I could help out with, I'll try. I, I, sometimes it comes down to the specifics um it's hard for us to give the specific information that you guys need for the model but but we can okay talk about that yeah i yeah. think yeah. If, if if the numbers exist you know it, it, you know if we have estimates of you know the amount of um controlled release mm -hmm. you know that would be used and and what that translates to you know how much reduction in leaching that translates to that's it's not uh, it's not hard to do that drag versus residential. It's just a, a matter of like having the yeah the numbers that we need to to translate that into a, a change in in the input to the model. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, and that this kind of relates, I guess, to scenario nine too, right? So it's sort of the same idea. Um, we would just again, you know, what we're looking for is you know an, an array of concentrations going to the model. How we get to that point is what we're all talking about here. We we'll go from concept like this to some sort of spatial data and some assumptions on how nitrogen loads will change response to these things and then converting that of course back to our model code. So you know anywhere along the way that we can get as much information to get us down that road is the, the better. And so and the, the purpose I think of today is just kind of like shotgun blasts of kind of what our understanding is right now, what we need and you know and then there's a lot of food for thought here for everybody. Um, to get into. So um, all this is great. Um, it's all great information. And, and uh, you know, it, it kind of brings us sort of the, just rounding out the last two scenarios here. Uh, you know, the, we have these was red. I mean, you know, one of them, inflammation is shallow and narrow drain fields. You know, that sort of gets into simulating really small hydraulic features possibly. And not sure this model is, is a tool to do that. Um, certainly, you know, folks could do that, you know, with this model and make an insect that's even with even smaller bridge spacing and get into that. I don't know, you know, we, in a, yeah, there's ways to do these kind of things. I just don't know if we'll be able to get to this one. And which gets back to the whole business of, of priority. I don't know where this is on the priority list. It was pretty far down the list. So I kind of had a feeling that the original list we received from the PP was the kind of priority thinking was kind of baked into that list as well, which is towards the bottom. And then the last one, wastewater management actually needed to meet groundwater quality and quantity protection goals. You know, like what we talked about before um, during for the Suffolk County Subwatership Plan, you know, the, 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 the actions taken in the nitrogen reduction that is spelled out in the plan will be baked into these analysis that we just talked about because we'll be implementing those nitrogen reduction factors in, um, you know, they're baked into the, the scenarios. So that's in there. And this, this kind of scenario is getting more towards how do, you, how do you meet a goal? What do you have to do to meet a goal? And so this is definitely more of an optimization 
question. It's a whole other way of approaching nitrogen scenarios. With everything up till now, these are pretty much straightforward, uh, just application of, of a model and just changing sources to represent different actions that you're considering. When you get into something like 11, uh, that's asking the question, how do we, you know, if we want to meet this goal and we want to, so we want to uh, achieve this goal and what's the minimum amount of cost we have to do to make that. So there's a whole, uh, there's a, that's a whole set of questions. And I'll just bring this up here because actually we had a meeting um, last week. And one of the guys developed this, it's called SIRE. It's a, it's a nitrogen management optimization framework. You know, and I'll just float it out there. It's something that, that is actually the technology is now there and essentially, you know, it's like any optimization, it's like flow model optimization. You know, you, you use your transport model to generate response coefficients at some management scale, be it parcels or whatever, and look at the model, you run the model thousands of times and look at every response and every watershed to every parcel change. And that is a, a dense, large array, large arrays of the response coefficients. And then you, you can use this framework to on the fly, say, what if, you know, to run a management uh, scenario, we say, in this in this embayment, I want to basically re reduce nitrogen by eighty percent. What what combination of actions in all these different units will make that happen? And then you can minimize costs and all that kind of thing. That, so I just bring this up as a whole another it's a whole another world of scenarios. And the good thing is, it kind of instead of testing endless scenarios, you can actually uh, sort of in the a computer can tell you what the most the optimal it's something that's out there. Actually, the technology is there, but it's not something we, we're, you know, certainly set up to do as part of this project. So that, so this one, you know, would, would be something we probably would maybe do someday, you know, because we have the contacts with the people, with the folks that have written the software, and they're, you know, they certainly are available to help us. So, so that that is a possibility, but probably not for what we're talking about here. And that kind of like rounds out the scenarios. Um, and I think we got a. I don't. Well, oh, yeah. I think we we got a lot of our questions answered. I think. Um, yeah. You know, no, it's been great. Yeah, the subwatersheds plan, especially. So, you know, we appreciate that, and so I think we're kind of all green up until through the, uh, the subwatershed plan scenarios, except for the build out, and then we get into these other scenarios, and we can work through these while we're starting to crank on um, some of the, uh, the scenarios we just talked about. Before, you know, we can maybe fill in some of the blanks and what we need for these other scenarios. So we have some time. And so, and like I said, we can we can schedule a smaller breakout group, um, you know, and, and talk about the, the, the details. We can have uh, folks come actually come out to the towns physically and maybe work with the towns directly. You know, there's, we have some, you know, we have some ways of, of kind of dealing with all this, but we have some time, I think, to do it because we have our, our hands full just with the, scenarios that we'll be starting with here. And it kind of, I think there's another slide here, I think. Um, yeah, yep. hold on. Oh. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. So, this so is, we can, I can, we can start to talk about. <laughs> yeah, so what we did is, you know, uh, it's the other part of the scenarios is, okay, Sure, here are the scenarios. One of the loads to receptors. Well, what receptors? How many? How do you delineate it? This is what we currently are using. It's something we kind of came up with by looking at um, sort of the, some of the coding uh, delineations in the watershed plan, as well as the USGS watershed um, delineations. And we sort of subdivided some or aggregated some. Um, it's just our current take on it, but this is completely mutable. Um, you know, so in, so. This is another big question for, you know, coming up with the final uh, set of receptors. And you know, we can either do it to be consistent with the Southern County Subwatershed Plan, you know, and or the USGS watersheds. They're a little different, but not much. Um, or it could be something that's more more local input uh, determined by stakeholders. I mean, a, a town, you know, the interest a town might have in certain water bodies being broken out and separated. They may want to understand loads in this cove versus that cove. If, if that's aggregated in, you know, the more regional analysis, they may want to break things out. So we're kind of back to, to putting stuff back onto the towns in terms of what water bodies 
what groupings of model cells essentially into receptors that they want to see. Like so that this is a you know again we have some time to do this because we're still we have our hands full with a bunch of other things here. So I'll just I'll just throw this out there uh, as something that you know we're completely flexible on. We just want to make sure that the final set of receptors that we use um, are acceptable for everybody. So Don, great Don can you just yeah. Sorry, I, I'm not sure I fully understand. You're asking here if the final receptors are, are potentially we would go into the towns and ask them to lead this. Well, so um, I just don't know if did we ever discuss this or I mean I think I operated under the assumption that we would align with the subwatershed plan, but I, I could be wrong. Well, you know, we, well, that's why the reality might be a combination of the two here. But we start with, we can start with a sub watershed plan. But there, I mean, a, a town may have an interest that, you know, I'll, my experience with this before we did this on the Cape was that we had, you know, we had a set of receptors in a regional sense. And we actually, when we met with individual towns and sort of the Cape Cod Commission, as a group of facilitating this. You know, they definitely had opinions about like, well, we think you know, we're, you know, we think you're having a problem with this particular water body. We'd like to see this separated from the larger water body that's really here currently. And so we did that. So, you know, this is just what we're using here to kind of uh, get the preliminary scenarios done, but we can we can do it however however people want it. Um, it's just something to think about if people don't want to really think too much about it, we could just do something with subwatersheds and aggregate it. You know, it'll be probably fewer receptors than we have here. But just to my mind, when I was looking at some of the codes, I'm like, well, you know, I think folks might want to know, you might want this watershed broke, this water body broken out separately because in a hydrodynamic sense, it looks like it might behave differently than the rest of it. But just so there's a there is some local, I assume some local interest in these water bodies that might not represented i guess if you know i just don't know uh, but anyway this is we could do it however um we want to do you guys want to do it because ultimately end, end users will be the, the communities so we want to we want to clear that with them and that uh you know that's kind of our thought on that uh, but the simplest okay yeah i know it's confusing but it's just you know yeah, yeah, no, uh, we'll reach out to the towns and, and we'll see um, what that looks like. I had just not thought of that, so thank you. <laughs> well, yeah, so, you know, when you're doing, you know, like you could, uh, you know, you, you could take a, a large a large water body, group all its tributaries together into one giant load, but there might be um, branches or, or, or some elements of, that are, you know, maybe behave in a hydrodynamic sense differently that you know, having a load for the entire system may not be enough. You may want to manage, um, look at loads in this particular part of a fairly complex you know, sinewy sort of environment. You know, so that's all. But um, we have all these codes. We have all this, uh, the, the watershed codes, the groundwater codes, uh, coding. So we have it all. Uh, and we started with that, and we just broke it up a little more, just using air photos to come up with this. But this is just us taking a guess because we had to start with something and whether or not we just use straight up sub watersheds ground watersheds or we let towns actually have some input to, you know to maybe break it up a little more you can always of course you can always aggregate it back to the sub watersheds if you wanted to um, you, just, you just have the option to have more detail than you might get if you just use you know the more regional codes that's all but we i just introduced it as a thought but it's but it's it's something that we don't have to have right now. But before long, we'd want to get this nailed down because there's some, uh, on the modeling side, there's some things that have to be changed to kind of like represent these, like, you know, how we group these cells. So anyway, just something to, one more thing to think about. And we can, again, we can talk later about it, about the details. But we could, you know, I think we did talk about this a while back sent out a shape file and you know it was you know, it didn't really put too much headway on it but i'll just bring it up here because the other side of the scenarios is 
what water bodies are you actually simulating? And, and I know we're being consistent with the sub-watershed plan, so maybe we stick with those, but subdivide them here and there such that, such that they can be aggregated back to the exact same sub-watershed scale if you wanted to. Maybe something like that. So it would probably be a combination of two. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, uh, and so, yeah, I think of one more here, uh, Pulan, I think that's, that'll wrap it up. Oh, no, you're well, so it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah I this, quickly, I can show that off. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me just quickly open that up. Well, hey, Claude, do you want to give a little, hey, Claude, do you want to give a little description on that slide before you launch into the, the demo? Sure, totally, yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, does everybody still, oh wait, no, I'm not sharing anymore. Boy, howdy. All right, sorry about that, folks. All right, one second. All right. Um, So going back to that slide, all right. So basically the dashboard is uh, something that I have coded together using open source um, Python tools. So um, it's a, I envision it being a way that um, we can allow people to sort of access and, and visualize the, the nitrogen loads that are reaching those receptors that Don was just talking about. Um, so, this tool set would be something that we could potentially um, host on uh, a website, um, but at the very least would be something um, that we could provide as a, basically a, a file that, that if, if people have um, some experience with Python, they could you know, run themselves um, and, and, and take a look at. So I'd like to very quickly um, show you guys what that looks like on my screen. Um, let's just see here, stop the share and open that up really quickly. One second. Okay. All right. Share this screen. Okay. So this is what is known as a Jupyter notebook. Um, and so it just it allows you to run Python code. Um, but that part is not really the part that is of interest. Um, once you run this code, we get an interactive dashboard um, that will hopefully pop up shortly. <laughs> All right, cool. So this is an interactive dashboard um, where scenarios can be listed out on the left here. Um, so these are, you know, seven of the of the ones that we've been talking about. These are preliminary versions of them. They'll change, you know, based on our conversations today. Um, there's also a sort of time period slider that you can move around for the next 100 years of the model. Um, and then on this map, you can zoom in and out, pan around, look at um, these receptors. You can click on them, and then it populates the, the time series uh, on a graph down here. Um, so on the y-axis, this is the daily nitrogen load. And then on the x-axis is, is time starting in 2019. Um, and so then as you sort of check these off, the ones that are displayed either show up or disappear. So for example, if we wanted to just look at the SWP um, versions uh, of the scenarios, you, know, you can do so and you can uncheck the ones that you don't want to look at. Um, you know, you can zoom in to a certain period of time in the model, that kind of thing. Um, and as you pan over this, it tells you what year you're looking at, what the load is, and also what scenario it is. Um, so yeah, we envision that this is like a way that end users could potentially access the data in a nice, clean, uh, functional way 
in addition to how we normally, you know, data releases at the USGS, where we it's a really you know big data dump uh, of information that. Um, this could be a, a nice, uh, clean way to have people um, access the data uh, and interact with it in a, in a, um, in a sort of easy interface. So are you saying that this is going to be something that's available the way the continuous water quality monitoring stations are, or something that we could take and house on our own server? We are just starting down a path with the Geospatial Center at SOMAS on Stony Brook, and I'm wondering if this is something that could be housed there or if USGS no. would house it like the stations. Uh, I would say, um, well, so, Paul, you said you could actually, this could be hosted on GitHub with a link, right? I mean, the bottom line Yeah, is, so very, uh, yep, sorry, go well, ahead. <laughs> the, 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 the bottom line is this is all public domain, so we just have to make sure uh, the fundamental science practices in USGS, we got to check with the, the secret police up in Albany to make sure like, <laughs> like we're, we're doing everything. So, I mean, the answer is yes. Just we'd have to go through some hoops to do all that because, you know, that, but yet, I mean, there's no reason this is all public domain. The results are public domain and these are all free work tools. So I think it's maximum flexibility for that. But uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's just, uh, you would, Somebody with an understanding of Python could run this, uh, which is, you know, a lot of folks are picking that up now. And then, but Claude, you said, you said you could also be, you'd be hosted at GitHub for free, right? Yeah. For the link. Yep. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's fairly easy to, I haven't implemented it yet because this data, you know, is, is not, um, not allowed to publish it yet, but um, it is in the very simplest sense, very easy to, save this at a in a data repository that then someone with a link would you know without having to download anything could click that link and be taken to a page that looks just like this um you know that the the only downside of that is that they would maybe look at this code <laughs> um but then you know down at the bottom this would be populated um the other alternative is that you serve it on a on a website like you were just talking about choice. And then, and then people would only ha have to look at the actual dashboard. Um, and so yeah, I think there's a, 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 a number of ways we could go about doing it. Um, and like Don says, we'll just have to make sure that they comply with the, the science practices. Yeah, and we are doing, we're doing more, in, you know, the USGS in general, you know, we're trying to move into more online mappers, you know, to make the, make our, you know, um, Make the science more publicly available you know, on the web. So I mean, there is a, you know, with the USGS in general is trying to do more of this kind of thing. So I'm sure we can just jump through the hoops as we need eventually and do something like have it on the web. But it also it is, you know, you could actually, well, you could zip this up into a folder and somebody could just, it's all freeware, could, could download it, uh, put it onto their computer and run this themselves. So. Yep. You know. Right. I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking. If it's in GitHub, we can grab the code. You can grab it. Yeah. Yep. Right. And yep. and theoretically run it. I just uh, obviously you have to go through the channels to release it. I, I completely appreciate right. that. Um, I was just wondering if if that if this was going to be open data, right? If indeed we could just take the code, or I mean, I'm happy to put a link on whatever our or P, the PEP and dashboard is, I mean, we're developing that for many yep. other tracking purposes, but um, it sort of would be awesome to, to have this, yeah. either that a link great. there or on there. Yeah, no, that sounds really, that sounds really wonderful. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah, but like I said, we, have, we just have to, you know, we're getting a little, a little over our skis here, not too bad, but I just, we just have to kind of run this past, uh, you know, the USGS police. Um, and, and but there are definitely ways of doing this. So, but we hadn't really talked about a dashboard before. So um, it was great that you know we could show what the has been up to. I think he, I think he came up with a really cool thing here um, myself. Um, but yeah, so so that's the dashboard. And and um, so I think I had one more slide. Yep. Yep. That we could just, Let me switch over. Yeah, that we could just kind of run through. Is that you know we're uh, we're, we're pretty 
close to the timeline that we envisioned back in August last year. We're kind of on that timeline. So, but I just want to remind everybody, you know, what the what the timing is here um, for the, the rest of the project. So we call this plans, you know, and so we have we have a number of uh, you know of projects aligning here, feeding into all this work, and you know we have this big effort to finish up this long island sustainability model. We need to have that done in the May timeframe um, for a number of other reasons. And so, you know, there's, so that is work that's gonna be going on, you know, finished in May to June. Um, we then have to run our final historical nitrogen simulation, simulations and Jack will have his final 1900 to 2019 sources in there with probably some sensitivity analysis in there related to looking, you know, testing the, you know, the, the air potentially on different source terms, assumptions, that kind of thing. That's all gonna get done. And then we have to take, so that will now have a dynamic freshwater saltwater model. Or, uh, that, so we'll have an interface. We then have to sort of retrofit uh, the inset model. Well, I was just showing with all that new information, new hydraulic activity fields, new everything. We got to test the consistency between the two, all the same stuff that's already been done. We, we've got to redo that, that's fine. Um, Again, that's going to be early summer. And then on the scenario side, you know, we want to have, probably have these scenarios completed May to June, you know, with things like, um, you know, the baseline scenarios and the sub watershed plan scenarios, that'll be done more like in April or almost now, right? So, but some of the other ones that may take some legwork on our part and also in the, uh, in the part of some new folks, you know, we'll, we have some time for that, you know, May to June and then run scenarios in the summer. Um, again, some will already be done, we won't, you know, we'll, we'll, but I would like to complete all the scenarios that we're going to do, you know, sometime in the summer, certainly. And then moving on to the sort of document, documenting and dissemination of results, you know, as of right now, I think we need to write two reports for this uh, uh, project. The first is one that sort of documents the regional scale, historical nitrogen loading simulations that we've been talking about for a while. Um, but that's a large enough effort. That's it should be a standalone sort of thing. Um, and then we have to write a report that's going to document uh, the Peconic inset model and some example scenarios. And then the companion to any report is a data release. And so we'll have a USGS data release. It'll be a pretty dry data release. I think what's going to be in there is essentially, I think we're envisioning sort of for however many receptors we wind up with, you know. 100, 150, 200, whatever. There'll be a CSV file for each receptor and then a column for each, uh, each scenario. And it'll be just a bunch of CSVs. And that way folks can actually say, okay, great Peconic Bay, I'm gonna grab that CSV. And I can now graph on my desktop at home. I can graph, I can graph nitrogen loads over time and respond to other scenarios that I don't care about. So that'll be it, you know, so CSVs are boring, but they're also probably the most portable uh, way of disseminating results. So that's kind of what the, what the products will be. So the dashboard it wasn't really envisioned as a product. It's just something that seems to have some possibilities here. And so we'll, we'll put a question mark on that, like we just talked about, and maybe find a way to, to serve that on the web, you know, as we, as we finish up everything else, we'll, we'll, we'll look into doing that. And, and, you know, a lot of what we're doing here, of course, is going to be directly a benefit to the work we're doing in the Long Island Sound elsewhere, uh, these the watch models that, that we showed earlier. So this is all kind of related and coming together. Um, but that's, so we're gonna have a busy spring, summer, uh, and then some report writing in the fall, finishing those up. So that's kind of the timeline that we see. It's sort of, it's pretty much the timeline we laid out back when we last spoke um, in, I think it was August, late August. And yeah, so that's, that's kind of where we are. And, and again, this is as much about us getting information from you folks as it was about updating you guys on what we're up to so we hope uh we can maybe start some of that conversation we can have as many meetings in the interim as any working meetings as many work as many working meetings as we need um and so we'll I think stay in close contact going forward on um some of those things and you know it, but this was i think real useful uh for us uh the, uh, the feedback we just got exactly what we're looking for so thanks thank you yeah, guys yeah so so i guess that's about all we have um yeah 
Yeah, so any, is there any more questions or thoughts or? Just Ken, I just had one, one quick thought and not, it uh, looks like this will be down the road a little bit, but I think it would make sense at some point um, before running the scenarios, maybe to pick like a few, a few water, smaller water bodies that have like relatively shorter travel times and maybe compare the, the nitrogen uh, solute transport results that you folks get with the SWP just as a quick reality check, you'd kind of you'd kind of think if the if the dynamic dynamic element was kind of taken out due to and I'm assuming a couple of these exist, but you know if a, if a groundwater if a small watershed had travel times of ten to twenty five years, you'd kind of think the results would be pretty close to each other. You know what I mean? Um, for, yeah, yeah, that you know, you know, and so. You know, these are they're two different regional models, and kind of touched on this earlier. Um, uh, but we're you know we're but the watersheds are, are going to they're going to be similar. They're, they're two you know the two well calibrated models, and of course the inset models have a different discretization. So there's you know they're apples and different kinds of apples, so they're not going to be yeah, exactly yeah. the same. But, but you look at you know, and I think like we worry about it now, but actually we've been poking around and kind of comparing. Um, Watersheds from the, sub, uh, the subwatersheds plan with you know with, with the regional USGS model, and they're going to be similar. They're going to be very similar. We'll be, they won't be exact, but they'll be similar. And you know, right now we're using uh, um, the sub the, the, the subwatershed plan uh, uh, sort of like time of travel contributing area combinations, along with the, uh, the the nitrogen reduction goals that are spelled out there. And those are part. These are baked in. The scenario so that's going to be the exact same uh, it's just a matter of some yeah but it, we, we would certainly as we go along we're constantly comparing what we're doing with different things to make sure that something hasn't crept in there that we don't know about so so yeah you, you're totally right um you definitely want to kind of do some some ground truthing on things but they will be pretty similar um so of course the way of, the method of simulating nitrogen transport is different i believe uh I think CDMU is sort of a mass weighted particle tracking, so more of an implicit transport, uh, whereas this is actual solving the transport equation, so it's explicit, so there's going to be dispersion, there's going to be you know, processes that you can't represent, but the particle tracking will are kind of come along with the side transport analysis as a physical process. So, you know, you, so dispersion is one thing that will make things slightly different. Um, so there's a couple of things, but we're, yep, I totally agree, Ken. Uh, it's, it's definitely something that we, we try to do. Yeah, uh, no, I totally agree. Yep, they're going to be, the answer is definitely not going to be the same, but, you know, it would be just looking for gross, you know, right. if something was within 10, 15%, yep, that makes sense because they're, because they're different. Yeah. Something was 75%. Yeah, yeah and like spatial, yeah. spatial patterns too. I think it will be, we should yeah. expect sort of similar yeah. similarities there. Yeah. And, and, yep. So, um, yeah, it's on the list. And, you know, one thing we didn't talk about is, you know, uh, I think we're going to probably do a fair amount of sensitivity analyses on the loading, um, the loading, uh, the historical loading that Jazz coming up with, just to bracket some of the unknowns, because there are a lot of unknowns. I mean, it's a pretty tall order to sort of back of that number. And so we're going to probably have, we might, and this will be all in this report, we're going to probably show maybe with some scenarios, hey, what if we, you know, here's, here's a scenario assuming this is somewhat different historical load. You know, the legacy is really important now. And then we'll probably have we'll probably have to have a sensitivity slash uncertainty analysis on some of these scenarios. Um, you know, that's one thing that you know we didn't talk about. That'll be you know, we'll have to do something like that. Um, you know, so there's there's a couple of different things here that you know we'll be we'll be tackling. Um, but uh, you know, the other thing is, and, and we were set up to do this is the whole business of season in season off season because a. Uh, well, you, some of the uh, some of the dashboard that you showed, uh, we talked about before. You know, you it's it's you know what he what he, you just showed those graphs. That's a that's an average response to um to you know to the, a, a, you know a, a management action, right? Well, the reality is, you know, one half of, of, of a load is flow, and flow is not an average. It, 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 it's really different in season off season. So. 
you know, in a given year, you know, you may have a nice smooth graph, but in reality, it's going to be pretty spiky. And so you may have in-season loads that are much smaller than off-season loads. And so maybe when the growing season is at its height, maybe there might be less nitrogen around. So I just don't know, not being a biologist, I just don't know if this is a hydrodynamic dynamic flushing at a time scale much faster than these than the drama flow processes. I think there could be something to knowing in season versus off season loads. So we're building in that capability in case that's something that, that you folks want to see. So think about that. I mean, you know, as, a, as something that might be of interest as well. Yeah, and I guess yeah, that about covers it. Okay. Thank you so much, you guys. Do we have uh, any more questions before we wrap up here? Okay, so again, USGS, thank you as always for um, what's looking to be an exciting end this year, hopefully to this project. Um, we're all looking forward to it uh, and various Folks on this call will be hearing from the program office about some of these follow-ups and getting feedback and input um, into the additional information that we talked about. If anybody has any um, further questions that we can help facilitate uh, with the USGS, please reach out to us. Uh, as always, uh, thank you very much, everybody, and have a great weekend. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye.